Hello and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 277, recorded on January 24th, 2023. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. We start this week with a story that's just as relevant for us as it might be for some of you out there. Canonical is making it known that we are fast approaching the planned end of life for Ubuntu 18.04. Yeah, the Bionic Beaver was a famous release and one that seemingly was well adopted by IoT vendors, at least according to some canonical little birdies. But as we all know, every Ubuntu LTS comes with five years of standard support. And that has to end sometime. But you can pay for extended support. Canonical calls that extended security maintenance. Yeah, or as we call it, monetizing what a pain in the butt upgrades are. Uh, Or ESM for short is what they refer to it as. And they offer that, and that gives you an additional five years of a type of support. Here's how Canonical describes the service. Quote, ESM enables continuous vulnerability management for critical, high, and medium CVEs. During this period, we no longer improve the distribution, but we keep it secure. It's interesting, and I noticed that low CVEs are not on that list, I suppose. I suppose that's probably fine. So I guess consider this a PSA, friends. The clock is ticking, and uh, we have until the end of April to either migrate or pay up. If you're not quite ready to pay, though, Canonical also offers their Ubuntu Pro program, which includes ESM support and is available for free on up to five machines, or up to 50 if you're an official community member. Yeah, that might be the route we go. I mean, this is definitely a choice we're going to have to make soon because we have a rather important system in our studio that runs 18.04 right now. I am happy to say, though, we just successfully upgraded one of our other 18.04 boxes. In fact, it wasn't just an upgrade, really, as so much it was as a rebase to Nix OS. That's a story that's in Linux Unplugged 494, if you're interested. And if you're planning to jump straight to Ubuntu 22.04, well, you might want to wait just a few more weeks. Canonical's Wukash Zemzak explained in an email to the Ubuntu developer mailing list that, quote, As there were some unexpected complications during the preparation of our hardware enablement 519 kernels for Jammy, and with Shim 15.7 making its way to the archive, we decided that more time is necessary to get everything ready. We decided to move the 2204.2 release date to February 23rd. One of the world's most impressive and really long-running open source projects had a significant update this week. Wine 8.0 has been released, and one of the major changes here is the conversion to the PE format for various modules. This is the format used by Windows, and an essential milestone for Wine because it's trying to increase compatibility with copy protection systems and 32-bit applications running on 64-bit hosts. This has been quite the slog to get the various modules converted, and there is, of course, still work to be done to finish it all up. But when combined with the improvements to the WoW64 subsystem, Wine developers tell us it will be, quote, fully possible to run 32-bit Windows applications without needing 32-bit libraries. That's going to be great. Now, I'm going to tap the brakes just a bit because there's plumbing all around that needs to be done. But we have groundwork here, people. We are in sniffing distance, and this is going to be a considerable quality of life improvement for new wine users, or really any wine user on Linux, trying to get a game or application working for the first time. If If you've ever experienced this issue where maybe you're on a 64-bit system and you have no 32-bit libraries and all of a sudden you want a Wine application and you need 32-bit libraries, you have to begin a journey. And it's a journey that installs many, many packages. Yeah, really since the Linux desktop transitioned to 64-bit, this mix of architecture dependencies has been rough and sometimes an outright deal breaker for some users and some systems. And just on top of that life-improving feature for Wine users, there's also been a plethora of Media Foundation fixes and improvements, and those are going to help some of those audio and video issues that maybe impacted your favorite game or application. So this is an update to watch for. 
The Open SUSE project is taking some notes from Fedora's collaboration with Cisco and has come up with a solution to make it easier to install the massively popular H264 codec. Fedora really showed the way here, and now SUSE is really showing us that creating the tooling around these complicated problems and making life easier for the end user, that's where a Linux distribution can really still make a difference even in 2023. And let's be real. Playback of one of the world's most popular video formats is absolute table stakes for a desktop operating system. Linux are not at this point. It's nice to see this get handled this way. I think we've recently seen the H.265 codec not handled so well by, by Fedora. So it's sort of refreshing to see OpenSUSE take a more thoughtful approach here. They explain a bit in an announcement saying, quote, Cisco which the OpenSUSE project is very thankful for their efforts, agreed to an approach on OpenH264 redistribution via a Cisco-owned infrastructure to OpenSUSE users. A release workflow for OpenH264 was envisioned, and a three-step system handled via a set of scripts in OpenSUSE's release tools. Yeah, if you're curious about that three-step system, they go into some detail. We have it linked in the show notes, but essentially they go on to describe how the script will work, and they go into a bit about how the open build service will play a role, and then they wrap it all up with this part of their announcement. They say, quote, potential improvements have already been discussed to improve the existing workflow, but the initial efforts are set to provide OpenSUSE a more simplified experience after installation. If you find the holidays tend to mess up your schedule, well you're not alone. Linus Torvalds is feeling the same. As a result, Linux 6.2 is getting a slightly extended development cycle. In the announcement of 6.2 RC5, Linus wrote, quote, Okay, so I thought we were back to normal after the winter holidays at RC4. Now, a week later, I think I was mistaken. We have a fairly sizable RC5, so I suspect there was still pent-up testing and fixes from people being off. Anyway, I am expecting to do an RC8 this release regardless, just because we effectively had a lost week or two in the early RCs. So, a sizable RC5 doesn't really worry me. I do hope we're done with the release candidates growing, though. And with that, we're expecting Linux 6.2 will be released sometime in mid-February. Linode.com slash LAN. That's where you go to get $100 in 60-day credit, and it's a great way to support the show while you are checking out a simple but powerful platform. You've been racking servers for 20 years, you're going to love it. If it's your first, you're going to find it approachable. A game server, a personal VPN, maybe you're ready to try out Nextcloud or deploy Mastodon. If you need it to scale to your business or maybe something goes viral, Linode can help reliably serve millions of visitors too. And unlike entry-level services that lock you into their platform, Linode gives you a full backend to access and customize and control your server to fit your needs. I know because I've been doing it for years. And their DNS manager is powerful, lets you easily switch things around when you want a domain name pointed at your box. SSL certificates are no big deal. And of course, the tooling is straightforward. And they have great documentation and 24-7 support. Go try it out, get 100 bucks, and deploy something. Learn something and see why we've been using it for years. Sign up today at linode.com slash LAN. Get that $100 and support the show. That's linode.com slash LAN. And thanks to Collide. Visit collide.com slash LAN. You know the old saying, when the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. The traditional approach to device security is kind of that hammer, a blunt instrument that can't solve nuanced problems. Even after installing clunky agents and users hate, IT teams still have to deal with mountains of support tickets over the same old issues. And they have no way to address things like unencrypted SSH keys, operating system updates, or pretty much anything going on with a Linux device. Collide gives IT teams a single dashboard for all devices. Mac, Windows, and even Linux. You can query your entire fleet to check for common compliance issues, or even write your own custom checks. Plus, 
instead of installing intrusive software that creates more work for IT, Collide's lightweight agent shows end users how to fix issues themselves. You can achieve endpoint compliance by adding a new tool to your toolbox. Visit collide.com slash LAN to find out how. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash LAN. Back in 2019, an incident led to a high-profile container vulnerability being discovered that, well, through a series of steps, enabled the overriding of the RunC container runtime binary from within the container if that container was not taking advantage of user namespaces. This binary should not have been visible or writable from within the container. However, a determined attacker was able to gain access to this binary through slash proc slash self slash exe, which refers to the binary executable for the current process. The attacker waited for RunC to exit, which allowed them to reopen the file descriptor with write access and overwrite the RunC binary. And since RunC runs as a privileged user outside the container, this becomes a privilege escalation, enabling a takeover of the entire host. The issue involved in that compromise became known as CVE 2019-5736. And a complex workaround was implemented in RunC itself to try and prevent similar vulnerabilities in the future. You could almost call the workaround innovative, RunC copied its binary image into a memfd area and then sealed that area. Control was then passed to that copied image before entering the container. And in this sealing process, it prevents any modification to the image. Even if that protection were to fail, the container would still be running from an independent copy of the binary that can never be used again, making it impossible for the attacker to exploit this vulnerability. Although this solution kind of seems elaborate, it effectively plugged the hole in protected systems, even in production today. And we're definitely grateful for that. But it's not really an ideal solution. I mean, it's obviously a bit complicated, and it was patched in RunC itself, and any other container runtimes that might be vulnerable, they're just going to have to figure out and copy the same technique. If we maybe had a fix or some more options in the kernel, perhaps we could solve it in a simpler way. And a patch set submitted by Linux kernel developer Giuseppe Scrivano could do just that. It takes a simpler approach to the problem by disabling access to slash proc slash self slash exe as a way of blocking image overwrite attacks. Specifically, it adds a new PRCTL command called PR set hide self exe that can be used to disable access to slash proc slash self slash exe entirely. And when you enable that option, any attempt to access that file from the owning process will be met with an error as if the file no longer exists. Now, this is a one way operation. Once it's turned on, it cannot be reversed until the next exec ev call is made which will reset this option to the disabled state. It's worth noting here that this feature is optional, so any program that wants to protect its executable image in this way must request it specifically. But the goal here is that this simple call will replace the more complicated workarounds that are currently used by the likes of Run C to prevent this type of attack. And, well, the thinking is that an additional PRCTL call is a small price to pay if it eliminates the need to create a new copy of the binary every single time a new container is launched. We'll see if this, if this quote-unquote better fix is ever actually implemented. Um, LWN has some great coverage, and as Jonathan noted over there, the patch set's been posted three times and hasn't received any substantive comments from anyone at those particular submissions. So... I think I agree when he says, quote, it would appear that this change is simply waiting for the wider community to take notice of it. And I can understand that, you know, not only do we have a workaround in place, but there's also some general questions if this is even the right solution, if this is something that could be done differently. There's definitely upsides to this approach, but I don't think we actually know if it's the right one yet. So we'll keep an eye on it and update you when we know more, just like we do for everything else going on in the world of Linux and open source. So don't miss a single episode of Linux Action News. Go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe 
for all the ways to get new episodes. And LinuxActionNews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch. Got a hot tip? Did we miss a story? Boost in with a new podcast app and tell us what you would like to hear us cover. And we'll be back next week with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. That's all the news for this week.